Thank you so much for having me and welcome everybody. Um, there has always been a certain amount of adversity between rock musicians and rock journalism. There's a spin-off of the saying, those who can teach, those who can't teach Jim. And it goes, those who can rock, those who can't write about those who can rock. Um, one of my other favorite anti-music journalism sayings came from the late Frank Zappa. And it goes, rock journalism is for people who can't write, interviewing people who can't talk, for people who can't read. But as many sticks, stones, and guitar picks as musicians care to fling at rock writers, there's no question that there's a symbiotic relationship between rockers and writers. Where would the Rolling Stones be if there wasn't a magazine formed in San Francisco in the 1960s to worship them and other musicians? Where would Madonna be without MTV? And how could Britney Spears possibly have garnered so much attention if the media wasn't following her every controversial move? For music fans, the music media serves an, imp an important role, providing them information about and access to artists they wouldn't have otherwise. <laughs> Who hasn't bought an album after reading a record review or checked out a band live after reading one of their glowing uh, concert reviews? For anyone who's ever picked up a copy of a magazine or read an artist interview in the New York Times, the value of music journalism should be apparent. For the past 20 years, I have been chasing and interviewing rock and pop stars, writing record reviews and checking out concerts for Rolling Stone, MTV, VH1, AOL, Revolver, Guitar World, and other magazines and websites. And along the way, I've developed an understanding of performers and their sometimes challenging world that's given me a little more insight into the psyche of both music lovers and musicians. And I've also accrued a bunch of stories that seem to go over pretty well at class reunions and family gatherings. I'll share a couple of the more dramatic ones with you now. In 1996, I was assigned to fly to Los Angeles to interview Ozzy Osbourne and write a story about the reunion of Black Sabbath. The journey had a double meaning for me. I had already interviewed Ozzy for a Q&A for Rolling Stone, and it went so well that when I contacted his wife and manager, the infamous Sharon Osbourne, and told her about the second assignment, she mentioned that she was looking for a writer to interview Ozzy for his official biography. And if the new interview I was doing went particularly well, we could talk about the possibility of having me work on the book. So heading into the interview with Sharon and Ozzy, I made sure I was fully prepared and wanted to deliver the true story, not uh, uh, <clears throat> the true story of Ozzy, no holds barred, not a version that was covered in, in fluff and uh, artifice. First, I interviewed Sharon at their home in Beverly Hills. And after getting a grand tour of the lavish house, she told me about how Ozzy had severe t attention deficit disorder. And when the two of them went to parent-teacher conferences together for their kids, he would sit there bored, paying no attention, and eventually do something embarrassing, like lift, lift his shirt up and down, exposing his belly. She also told me about the legendary fights they had and the time he tried to strangle her to death. Great, I thought. She's really opening up to me. And she really wants me to write the true story, not some fluffy piece that's all style and no substance. So when I finally went in to interview Ozzy, I took off the gloves and asked personal questions about past animosities between him and the members of Black Sabbath. The effect drugs and alcohol had on his music and life and what it was like to be regarded as the grandfather of heavy metal. I was supposed to interview him for 90 minutes, but as we proceeded, it became clear he was losing focus. That's when I asked a question that was certainly valid, but perhaps poorly phrased. I asked, some people have this idea that Sharon runs the show and that you're really a puppet on her string. A puppet? What do you mean a puppet? Ozzy replied. I rephrased the question saying, well, people have said that she makes all the decisions and that you follow suit. Ozzy paused for a moment and looked confused. Well, she's my manager, Ozzy stammered. That's what managers do, you know, tell you when to go on stage and off and, and, and who to talk to. After a long pause, we moved on. 
But five minutes later, Ozzy stopped the interview, saying he was tired and asking if we could finish it up the next day. No problem, I thought, and headed back to my hotel. About an hour later, I got a call from the Osborne's assistant, saying that Sharon wanted to meet me an hour early the next day, before the second part of the interview was scheduled to take place. Great, I thought, naively. She was so impressed by my interview style that she wants to talk to me more about writing Ozzy's book. Well, I showed up the next day excited about our meeting, and when I got into the office, I was told to sit down. Sharon kept me waiting there for about an hour, and then she finally called me in. Come in and close the door behind you, please, John, she said, flashing me a big, sweet smile. Then she lowered the boom. I don't know who you are or what you're trying to do, but you will not take down Ozzy. I felt as if someone had yanked the legs out from under me. For the next ten minutes, I tried to explain to her how I had grown up with Black Sabbath who would turn me on to rock and roll, and I had no intention of smearing Ozzy into the dirt. I just wanted to tell the real story. Well, she laid into me for what seemed like the next half hour, telling me how I was trying to dig for something that wasn't there, and uh, that nothing I would say would have any effect on Ozzy's career. Then I was told to immediately leave the office. Needless to say, I never got to finish the interview with Ozzy. And the book was out of the question. To this day, she has blackballed me from covering any Aussie-related events. This is kind of amusing if you consider that this was several years before the uh, show The Osbournes was on MTV, a program that revealed Ozzy and all of his quirks and foibles. Another time, about three years earlier, an alternative rock magazine called Raygun sent me to London to write a cover story on a band called Swerve Driver. Now, they were about to release their second record. It was a great experience. I interviewed them at a London pub and went with them to their practice space to hear them rehearse for their upcoming show at the Reading Festival. While we were at the practice space, they told me about a, another popular British band called Chapter House, which was practicing right next door, and they asked me if I wanted to hang out with them. Now, I was a big fan of Chapter House. The band combined hazy, wobbly guitar sounds of My Bloody Valentine with some of the great ethereal melodies and harmonies comparable to their peers in the Oxford band Ride. I only had one reservation. While I had never interviewed the band, I had reviewed one of their shows at the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. for the now defunct weekly Melody Maker. It's a British magazine. And while I praised the opening band, the Boston dream pop group The Drop 19s, I wrote a scathing review of Chapter House's performance which, by comparison, seemed uninspired and contrived, as if they were merely going through the motions instead of blazing new ground. Well, when I got into Chapter House's practice room with Swerve Driver, they were extremely nice and offered to let me watch them practice some of their new tunes. I was thrilled and sat in awe as they burned through some dizzying new songs. I praised their performance and then we drank a few beers and started chatting. They told me they had a great time touring America and they added that they loved Americans. But they only had one bad experience with an American ever. Oh, I asked, do tell. Oh, we played the best show of our life in Washington, D.C. at the 930 Club, and this wanker American writer, John Wiederhorn, gave us a terrible review in Melody Maker, they said. For a moment, I did a double take. Were they just playing with me? Did they know I was this wanker to whom they referred? Unsure and uninterested in waiting for an answer, I didn't do what I wish I had, stand up for myself and point out that I was the villain they so despised. No, instead I thanked them for their time and skulked out of the room with my tail between my legs. If nothing else, these stories illustrate the unpredictable nature of music journalism and the fact that if you want to succeed, you have to have a thick skin. I've been threatened in person, insulted on stage, flamed on the internet, and received my share of hate mail. If I had a dollar for every time I'd been turned down by an editor, I'd be able to buy my own magazine. And once, I sent a Rolling Stone writer named David Frick, who also freelanced for Melody Maker, my clips asking him for criticism. And when I finally got him on the phone, he told me why my writing was, quote, far from appalling. Five years later, he hired me as an associate editor at the magazine. In addition to having a thick skin, if you really want to be in this business, 
you have to believe in yourself and not take no for an answer. I won't lie to you. It's harder now to break into music journalism than ever. The music economy has wreaked havoc with the publications industry. Newspapers are collapsing by the day. Magazines are folding left and right. And websites are laying people off faster than GM. Everyone's relying on more and more freelancers rather than staffers to keep the copy flowing. So there aren't many jobs to go around. At the same time, <clears throat> everyone seems to have cut their pay rates for freelancers up to about 50%, and in some cases more. And do-it-yourself blogs are popping up like weeds to capture readers still eager to find new outlets. This may all seem discouraging, but I know from experience that writers don't give up. If you're driven to be a journalist or a music writer, nothing's going to stop you. It takes a rare breed to say in the face of this adversity, screw it, I don't care, this is what I want to do, and I'll do whatever it takes to be a part of it. For those of you interested in pursuing this masochistic goal, I have some advice. First of all, decide what kind of writing you want to do and read everything you can within the field. But don't stop there. Read investigative journalism, editorials, sports reporting, obituaries. Read newspapers, magazines, websites, and blogs. Learn from your favorite writers. Try not to copy their style, but learn what's good by determining what you like about their work and what you don't. Then try to develop your own style and your own voice as a writer. If you're still in college, get active with your college paper. Learn to write different kinds of stories. Cover different sorts of beats. Now, now's the time to try everything you're interested in. Take photos, edit copy, fact check, and develop the skills you'll need to succeed in the journalism field. If you're not a journalism student, that's fine. The best way to learn about writing is simply to do it. So write all you can. Keep journals, try to write for blogs, start your own blog. Just learn by doing it. And perhaps most importantly, look for an internship, internship in the field you want to pursue. Call your favorite magazines or media companies and find out if they have an internship program. Most places have interns during the summer, but some, including MTV and Revolver, have them all year long. Some of these, these positions pay, but most don't. But the experience looks great on a resume, and certain places will actually let you write. That's something to consider when you apply, actually. If you work for NBC or CNN, they might uh, have you opening mail, filing photos, and making coffee. It'll look good on a resume, but if you work with a less glamorous place, you're more likely to get real hands-on experience. Weekly paper often let their interns write, sometimes a lot. When I was in college, I interned for a weekly newspaper called the Montgomery County Sentinel in, in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. And uh, through that, I got a lot of clips. Those clips were very useful in landing other internships and freelance gigs down the road. Whether you're interning or working professionally, it's extremely valuable to network. If music journalism is your thing, go to shows, meet other writers, meet the promoters, meet the managers, and maybe most importantly, meet the publicists involved in promoting all the different bands and all the different labels. They're the ones that know what's coming uh, what's coming out, what records are coming out, and uh, they can connect you with records, concerts, and bands and give you pointers about what magazines, websites, or blogs might be looking for writers. Look for websites you'd like to write for and email them about possibly contributing. There are plenty of short-staffed blogs right now and they're always looking for strong writers and are willing to pay, albeit not much, but it's a worthwhile experience, even if they're not paying at all. Um, don't let that discourage you. The magazines that don't pay can sometimes be some of your most valuable uh, experiences. It's worth writing for free to get your clips going, and that's what you're going to need if you're going to climb the journalistic ladder. Remember, no one starts out of college writing for Rolling Stone. If you um, comb the racks of bookstores for magazines that you're interested in writing for, that's also helpful. 
go through the, uh, the magazine staff boxes and check for the names and addresses of editors that you can contact and send clips. Also, if you want to be taken seriously as a journalist, stay away from writing puff pieces. A puff piece is a portrait of an individual or an artist that chronicles their achievements in an extremely flattering way to the point of being practically PR. As a young music fan or sports fan or follower of politics, it's very easy to get caught up in the moment and feel so excited about being in the company of celebrities or personalities and power brokers that all you want to do is make them like you. That's a huge mistake. The worst music journalists I've ever met are the ones who want to hang out with the bands they interview and befriend them. You're not there to fawn over these people or make buddies. You're there to get a story. That means treating them with respect and knowing your subject. Doing your research and then asking intelligent questions based on what you've discovered. Maybe save the hardest questions about controversial antics or sore points until the end of the interview. But don't be afraid to ask them because that's where you'll get your most revealing uh, information. Also, write down questions that you care to ask, but don't necessarily follow your list item by item. Um, when you ask a question, pause, wait for an answer, and then bounce off to the next question, but listen to what the person who uh, you're talking to has said to you, and if they said something that, that uh, opens up doors, feel free to go there. Um, elaboration is sometimes the best way to get good information. Sometimes the questions that you've written down are the throwaways, and it's the follow-ups that yield the real inside information. The best interviews flow like conversations between two friends, or even between an individual and his or her analyst. It's amazing the kinds of personal and revealing things a total stranger will tell you in an interview with the tape recorder running. It's all about approaching the interview in the right way. A few more words of advice. While you're waiting to land that plum gig at your favorite magazine, be aggressive and look for other places that are hiring. Even if, you're not, even if they are not in your chosen field. I graduated from Boston University with a degree in journalism, and while I worked from home, freelancing reviews for places like Melody Maker, the Boston Phoenix, Alternative Press, and Raygun, I held day jobs that paid the rent, or at least provided beer money when I was living at my parents' house. The first job I got out of school was as a staff writer for a newsletter for the petroleum industry called Oil Express. That makes, the cro that makes Crochet Digest seem salacious by comparison. About a year later, I moved on to a weekly community newspaper called the Montgomery Village News, where I worked in a tiny office and was the only staffer under 40, and the only one more interested in Pearl Jam and Nine Inch Nails than daycare and home repairs. And since I was doing some freelance interviews from the office with bands like Mud Honey and Godflesh, and I was overheard doing these interviews on the phone, I was considered somewhat of a delinquent, even though I was always uh, there at community meetings and never missed a deadline. Speaking of community meetings, my undoing at the paper came the night of an environmental, uh, an environmental committee meeting that fell on the day Nirvana played the 930 Club just after they had released their second album, Nevermind. But before the first single, Smells Like Teen Spirit changed the face of rock and roll. Knowing I was going to miss the show because I was, I was obligated to cover this meeting in which wealthy conservative homeowners discussed the health of the ducks in the village pond, I expressed my discontent visually by slumping in my chair, putting my feet up on the chair in front of me, and grimacing frequently. The next day I was fired for having a bad attitude and being oppressive to work with. As it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. I got in touch with a writer I admired at a music trade tip sheet that was then located in Great Neck, Long Island, called the College Music Journal, and he happened to be getting ready to leave the publication. So after checking out some of my clips, he recommended me for his position, and I became the metal co-editor of CMJ. I worked there for a few years, writing about alternative rock, Brit pop, and metal, and built up a bunch of record reviews. And while I was there, I continued freelancing at night. In 1993, I reviewed an album for CMJ called Pablo Honey by a then unknown band called Radiohead. Since CMJ was a tip sheet, 
Everything they reviewed was positive. And I gave a glowing review to this album long before the song Creep led uh, Radiohead on their way to stardom. I remember commenting that the record sounded like what, what uh, would go through your head if you switched from one rock station to another and only remembered the best songs. Apparently they liked that description because one day I got a call from their publicist telling me the band was flying into New York and she had no idea what to do with them since nobody knew who they were yet. She asked me if, if uh, she could bring them by the CMJ offices and I told her that was fine with me. And when these really young skinny guys from Oxford arrived looking sheepish, she asked me if I could show them around the office. I took them around and introduced them to the staff and I remember them uh, marveling at the number of CDs that were lining the shelves in the office library. After about 30 minutes of awkward but polite conversation, they left. A month later, you couldn't turn on the radio without hearing their song Creep. I left CMJ because I had built my freelancing up to the point where I could no longer handle a day job. I was writing for Melody Maker, Option, Alternative Press, Raygun, Tower Pulse, Guitar World, and I had just made inroads at Rolling Stone with their review editor, Anthony DeCurtis, who had heard me read some of my pieces at a coffee house event and liked what he heard. He gave me some album reviews, and after I had accrued a few, I started pitching larger pieces and managed to get a one-page feature on a band called Caius. And now a little word about editors. If you're writing a story for an editor, keep in mind that the editor is always right. You are like a work-for-hire employee, and the smoother your experience with your editor, the more likely you'll, likely you'll get work from him or her in the future. Editors are busy. They don't like to be disagreed with. They like writers who turn work in on time and don't haggle for an extra day or two to turn in a piece. They like clean copy with a minimum of typos and no spelling errors, especially when it comes to the name of the people in your story. They all like to assign stories in different ways. If you develop a relationship with an editor, find out if he wants you to call with pitches, email pitches, or wait for him to assign you a story. Find out if he likes long detailed pitches or short pitches that get right to the point. A good relationship with an editor can take you a long way, since staffs often switch at magazines. With some regularity, and editors go on to work for bigger publications where they may be able to throw you more work. Also, editors tend to know other editors, and if you're good and reliable, you're likely to get strong recommendations when one editor talks to another. As a freelancer, it's important to be, to be considered a jack of all trades. So even if you're not an expert in a particular genre or performer, if an editor offers you a story, don't turn it down because you think you're not qualified. Do some research and become qualified. One thing I learned freelancing is never to say no to an assignment. Once, I was doing some work for Entertainment Weekly when a new music editor came in. I had been trying to hook up an assignment with the magazine for a while, but had been unable to do so. Then finally, he contacted me. Dramatic pause. He contacted me and asked me to write a story on Paul Westerberg, the former singer for The Replacements. I told him I'd love to do the piece, but I was going on vacation with my wife and would be gone on the day the interview was to take place. No problem, he said. He'd hook me up again with something else down the line. Enjoy your vacation. I never heard from him again. Over the years, I have done some really exciting interviews with bands like Alice in Chains, Radiohead, Metallica, Rush, The Cure, and Tool. But one freelance assignment sticks, to me with, sticks with me to this day. In 1997, David Bowie released a new album, Earthling which was a combination of modern electronica and the classic rock songwriting for which he was known. And I got the opportunity to interview him for, for uh, a magazine called Swing, a new publication that had been launched by David Lauren, the son of Ralph Lauren. I was given one hour with David Bowie in a conference room, and the man was charming, articulate, funny, and utterly captivating. The time went by quickly and the conversation was great. It was just me and him in the room. There was no publicist or handler waiting in the wings, and neither of us was wearing a watch. Just as I was thinking, wow, David and I are really making a connection here. Bowie stood up and said, well, it's been an hour. Thank you so much, it's been a pleasure. And he headed for the door. 
He'd just done so many interviews over the years that he intuitively knew when our hour was up. After strictly freelancing for a while, I was hired to work for Rolling Stone as an associate editor. I was on staff almost a year and then worked on as, as a contract writer for the magazine for another two years. Then I became the executive editor at Guitar Magazine until I ran that publication into the ground. And it folded. Since then, I have held staff positions at Guitar.com, MusicPlayer.com, VH1, and MTV. As I got a little older, got married, and had kids, I realized I could no longer keep up with all the youngsters who were out clubbing every night, listening to all the latest music all the time, and breaking the new scoops that were rapidly hitting on the internet. So I stepped down from MTV. I decided that I needed a specialty. Since I had been a fan of heavy metal from the time I was a kid, and the music form seemed to be getting more popular again following a long dormancy, I decided to focus on that. Alternative and indie rock were just too unpredictable, and there was too much of a scene. Bands were in, then bands were out every three or so months. And you had to stay on top of every single development to be knowledgeable about what was going on. Metal was more dependable. Metal, me metal fans follow their favorite bands, and they do so for years. And while there are definitely shifts and developments in the genre, they're le less trend-oriented than those in other forms of music. Others in the industry seem to agree with me. In about 2003, Revolver magazine switched from being a general interest music publication to one that focused on metal, and I became one of their senior writers. I have written countless stories for them since, and have also worked as the editor of he MTV's Headbangers Ball blog. Currently, I'm working on my first book for HarperCollins called Louder Than Hell, The Unflinching Oral History of Metal, which should be out sometime in 2011. I encourage you all to buy it when it comes out. And if my words have somehow inspired you and you decide to enter the wild world of music journalism, I'll see you in the mosh pit. So, does anyone have any questions? My son has a roost rock band, so I'm trying to get my son. I graduated from here 40 some odd years ago, so that's, that, that's, that's where my music taste got frozen in. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out the, the genre and the publications and so forth, and I see so many publications coming and going. And, 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 and just for an example, um, we started subscribing to Taste Magazine, I don't know, a year or so ago. And, and I look at this thing and I can't figure it out. So, you know, how do you think about the, the genres that might interest you and the publications that might focus on that uh, genre? To start is by uh, figuring out what bands you like and what kinds of uh, genres they're in and uh, do a Google search. Find out, uh, you know, through other blogs that are within that genre what, uh, what websites might be out there, what, what publications might be out there, and what bands other people are recommending. Um, places like eMusic and iTunes have uh, special sections devoted to uh, uh, bands that you can follow if you like a certain band. And um, if your son is looking to break into, uh, you know, into the field and get noticed, um, I would suggest that he find uh, publications that uh, have like-minded like interests and to send them, um, you know, his demos. Um, contact. One, one good way to uh, to go in that direction is to, to find writers as opposed to editors in magazines because the, uh, the editors in magazines are usually dealing with established bands, um, bands that already have record deals and are hired. Um, so I would encourage uh, him to find people who are writing about this music and who are young and hungry and looking for new talent. Also, I'm assuming he has a MySpace page. That's a great way to, uh, to spread the word and uh, you know, um, reach out to people. Um, all the social networking sites, MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, um, can be really important. Uh, if they're playing shows, find out who's coming to the shows. Invite, have them, you know, in, invite uh, members of the press uh, to come and uh, you know, help spread the word that way. And uh, you know, once people take an interest, um, usually that interest will spread. And it's a, uh, you know, it's a good way to get discovered. One day and gone the next. For example, Pace right. uh, suddenly went from I think a monthly 
to putting out a, uh, a TV guide size publication every other month, and sometimes they don't publish, I guess, I don't know. Right. Yeah, it's a very tough time in the publishing world. And the time is uh, starting to look like highlights as well. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a difficult time. Um, advertising revenue isn't there. And uh, magazines and, and, and uh, newspapers are struggling just to stay afloat. Um, interestingly, there are a lot of websites cropping up. And uh, I would encourage you to reach out to them um, if you find that these magazines are coming and going and are hard to get, uh, get in touch with. Uh, web uh, sites require less money to stay afloat. A lot of magazines are actually moving onto the web. Most of them have their own websites as well. And then there's the whole world of blogs that uh, doesn't require, usually doesn't require paying, paying writers, can often be launched by just a couple kids in their bedroom. And uh, sometimes those can really develop a following and, and, and build up to the point where they're you know, influential. Take a, a publication like Pitchfork, which is now very relevant and very influential within the sort of alternative rock scene. Um, you know, they started with nothing. Um, and places like that are, are uh, you know, perhaps the new paradigm. Hey, I was going to say, so for some people who are interested in, in writing, I mean, maybe one way, in the old way, is sort of getting internships and stuff like that, maybe it's a bit more doing yourself where you start your own website where you're, you're cranking out the reviews yourself and maybe a couple friends and then maybe using the social networks, like, you know, on sure. the Facebook page or whatever. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's another alternative. Absolutely. Today. I mean, it's to uh, start your own thing and, and, and to, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun to do. Uh, you, can, you can build up a following. Um, there is a point, though, where you'll learn things at internships and with publications that probably don't already have the chops for when you're just, you know, kind of banging around on a, on a blog online. But it's a great way to develop a writing voice. And I mean, like I said before, the, the, the best way to become a good writer is just to write all the time. And blogs are a great way to do that. Yes? On your Aussie story, when you look back on hindsight on that, have you thought or considered the possibility, the fact that she let you in, and you were bold enough to say that, but they did say, that perhaps you could have possibly set a stage that maybe, you know, the Osborne's did come about. I'm not saying to over-exaggerate your own importance. Mm -hmm. The fact that you were bold enough to say that, perhaps they were bold enough to make that next step to actually put the Osborne's out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. To think that, um, unfortunately, she's a very, very volatile individual. Well, they both are. Yeah, oh, the, they are, and, you know, very intriguing, um, but, she thinks very little of music journalists and has a long list of people that she's blacklisted from, uh, she from the empire. Aware. Sorry? She may not have even been aware that you just, by the fact that you were bold enough to say something like that, you may have put something in there that she wasn't even aware of. Could be, could be, but... Uh, I mean, just because you shared such a story like that. Yeah. You know. What I found, found uh, ironic about the whole thing was that, you know, here I was asking a question, perhaps phrased, you know, in an inappropriate way. But here's a guy who has a past that is just filled with just every, you know, bit of decadence and debauchery and insanity and near-death experience and uh, that you can, you can picture. And, you know, one, one journalist asking a, a slightly, which I'm sure he wasn't even offended by. He probably went to her later and asked something about puppets. And uh, <laughs> in her effort to... To protect him, maybe, um, you know, she's often also a very uh, keen businesswoman, and if she smells something that she doesn't like for whatever reason, however irrational, she'll eradicate it. So it could be that she, he said something, and, and uh, she, you know, immediately got guarded and said, "Well, this guy, you know, I want him out. This is this piece is going to be, you know, negative and hateful, spiteful." And and this was really before Ozzy had completely rebuilt himself into this mainstream figure. I mean, he always had that, you know, he was always a legend among metal kids, but was a long way from, from becoming part of the mainstream. Yes?
as an actor, like, how do you stay professional if you're with somebody who's, like, comes off, like, getting insulted easily and different things like that? That's a good question. Um, you have to really feel out your, uh, your subjects. Um, part of the way to do that is to go in, in, uh, with a lot of preparation. Read other interviews that have been done, see how people have reacted with other journalists, and, and go into uh, an interview uh, not immediately being confrontational, but being friendly and, and uh, you know, proving to somebody that you know what you're talking about. Um, I've done some interviews with some very difficult people, who, some of whom either because they're shy or because they're antagonistic, will only answer questions with a yes or a no, or I'll give you three or four word answers. And it's really hard to do an adequate interview based on that. Um, once it got to the point where I said, well, look, you know, I, I, I want to write a good story here, and uh, you know, let's, let's work together to uh, uh, get something. What, what is it that you want to say? What would you want to get across as, as an artist? What do you want your fans to know? You know what are you trying to do? And that uh, opened things up a little bit more and, and uh, you know, was a bit of an icebreaker. But some people are just antagonistic and just uh, hate the press, go on with a chip on their shoulder, and you just kind of have to make the best, uh, best out of it that you can. Yes. Uh, is there a difference between a music journalist and a music critic, or do they overlap in the, in the field of rock and roll? Well, some people only write about uh, albums or uh, review shows. They're more because they're being, you know, critical of the music they're writing about, they're writing reviews, they're writing opinion pieces. Um, I would say a music journalist is somebody who's more in the field, interviewing people, writing trend pieces, um, giving uh, readers a sense of uh, what, what particular scenes are like and what particular artists are like, and providing more of that inside information. Um, and while they can be analytical in their approach and, and offer some insight, they're not really critiquing albums uh, or, or critiquing shows. Although I found that most music journalists I know do do both. <laughs> wow, you know, I was really hoping that somebody would ask that. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm in the middle of this book for uh, Harper Collins that that I mentioned. That's uh, an oral history of, uh, of heavy metal, uh, tracing the genre from the late 1960s to the present day. Um, we're doing interviews, um, me and a, a co-writer of mine who is the uh, producer of Alice Cooper's late night radio show. Um, and uh, we're, we uh, are, are talking to everybody and then presenting the story in their own words strictly. So it's an oral history. There's no uh, opinion or um, analysis. It's all written in quotes and told in uh, sort of a chronological form from the beginning to the present. Um, and we're getting some great stuff, but we have lots and lots and lots of work that still needs to be done. Um, and we're actually uh, uh, looking pretty hard for some uh, good in interns who are interested in the music and uh, who have some writing chops, some journalism experience is helpful and uh, would like to be involved. Uh, we'll definitely put their name in the book. Um, there's a lot of work to be done with uh, uh, transcribing interviews from, you know, with some, some big celebrities like uh, Dave Mustaine of Megadeth or Phil Anselmo of Pantera, um, Tony Iommi of Black Sabbath. So there's some, you know, some big stuff that needs to be done. Uh, we'd love interns to help us pick photos, um, to help call labels and, uh, you know, uh, get some information, uh, uh, some old archival stuff, background stuff maybe fact check things that need to be, uh, to be tackled if we're not sure on what happened in a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, for the right people, there's writing up or interviewing opportunities as well. So uh, if anybody is in, uh, you know, interested in, uh, in interning for the book, um, we're looking for people who can uh, devote as much or as little time as, uh, as, they, as they can. As much would be preferable. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, Definitely contact Professor Taig or, or me as I'm you know, heading out. And uh, let us know of your interest, because uh, we're definitely uh, getting rolling on this and would like to have some uh, people who are, are you know, really interested and uh, really talented. So.
have all these things in so we could like that there's, there's a, usually, if it's an in-person interview, there's a tape recorder rolling. Um, and then if it's a phone interview, um, yeah, everyone is, is pretty aware that they're being taped. Sometimes uh, I'll say, do you mind you know, if, if I tape the conversation? And I've never heard someone say no. Although I've heard of somebody who said no to a friend of mine, which is bizarre because then you end up transcribing everything either by hand on a, on a pad of paper or typing very, very quickly onto a onto a desktop and it can't possibly be as accurate. Um, so, so most uh, artists I know actually prefer uh, that the interview be taped so that there's a more accurate representation of what they said. And, and some people will bring their own tape recorders so that you don't misquote them. Wow. <laughs> and that's, that's a bizarre experience as well. Well, that's, that's an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon that opens a can of worms. The, the term off the record is uh, interpreted by many different people in many different ways. Um, I know some very established writers who uh, say that uh, if an artist tells me something is off the record, they have to do so before they make their statement that they want off the record, and then tell me when we're back on the record. Or he'll assume that after they've finished making that statement, that they are then back on the record. Um, if someone comes back to them later and says, oh, you know when I was talking about uh, all, all the drugs that I was doing in the, in, in the mid 80s and my wife didn't know about it, I, I, please don't print that. They'll say, well, you know, it wasn't off the record. Now I'm strictly against that. Um, the way I look at it, if, if someone wants something off the record, it's uh, not printable. Um, you know, so if any time during an interview they say, you know, can, can you please make this off the record, I will take something off the record. Um, if the interview is over and we've, let, we've parted ways and uh, I'm later called and asked to take something off the record, then I'll use some judgment and I'll decide how important it is to the story. Um, sometimes I will cut it and not put it in the piece. And then there have been times where uh, it's been something, you know, and, and in those cases I've said, well, look, this, what you said is really important and character revealing and it's actually uh, something that makes you look good it, 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 the way it was, it was revealed. I'm not out to, you know, put anyone... Um, you know, through the mud. So uh, I, I usually come out of that situation okay. But uh, there's also a difference between something being off the record and something being uh, not for attribution. So if someone will tell you a juicy tidbit about something and say, you know, this is off the record, I'll say, well, is this off the record or not for attribution? Now, if it's not for attribution, you could still go with the information, but you need to find another source to give you the same uh, information, or you can say, you know, according to a source close to the band, which most editors don't like to see, but when something's very controversial, or we'll get someone in hot water, then uh, sometimes it'll fly if it's an important part of a, uh, of telling a story. As a, as a younger journalist, and maybe working for a publication that wasn't so well known as Rolling Stone, how hard of a time did you have reaching an artist to interview, what to get that quote from? Did you always have to go through an agent or someone, or did you? An interview for a publication, and you've been assigned it by the publication. They'll be in contact with the artist publicist, so there'll already be they'll, there's already something that's uh, being set up. Um, <clears throat> if you're pitching something, on the other hand, and an editor says, "Yeah, go for it." then usually the, the route you take is you contact the, uh, the, uh, the uh, publicist um, for the label, although things are shifting so rapidly there may not be labels uh, in a few years. But there's always going to be some sort of a handler that acts as a go-between between the artist and the, and the journalist. Um, where you then get into a sticky situation is if you have a hard news story. Now here's something where, say, an artist is in a car wreck and it was his fault. He may or may not have been drunk and uh, someone was hurt in the process and there are reports on this. A record label is not going to put out a press release saying, you know, uh, the guitarist for Godsmack was uh, driving his guitar completely smashed, ran into a 90-year-old lady and uh, she's now in, in uh, you know, severe uh, condition in the hospital and will likely sue. That's not going to happen. You may get a statement saying there was some sort of a, uh, an accident um, and, uh, you know, their, their uh, details are, are not known. Um, you know, at that point, if you're, if you're investigating a news story, that's when you go to the, uh, to the police department and uh, talk to the uh, officers on the scene 
or uh, that's where you go to the hospital and go to the public information people there. Um, you know, you can even go to uh, uh, friends of artists or uh, uh, management directly. Uh, but there's a certain risk in doing that. You're likely to get labels and, and uh, publicists uh, pretty upset at you. Um, it's, risk the wor it, it's worth the risk, though, if you're covering a news story and uh, you, you, know, you need this information. And, and uh, publicists have pretty short memories because they need you as much as you need them when it comes to writing about their artists and getting their, their people in publications. Starting out, you know, um, get get to know these people. Um, if you don't know the publicist and you know the promoter, the promoter hired the band. They'll, you know, you can be asked to be introduced, or uh, an awful lot of young bands hang out after their shows and shake their fans' hands and sign autographs. And that's a good time to say, hey, look, you know, I'm I'm writing for this certain blog. I'd love to interview you when you have time. You know, I know now is probably not the right time, but let me uh, let me get your email or let me give you mine or my phone number. And if it's cool, I'd love to hook something up. And more often than not, these people are eager to get the attention in the press. And we'll talk to uh, you know, small publications as well as large ones. So yeah, that's definitely a good way to get rolling.